Lately, I've been getting a few requests to walk through how a manual implementation of an algorithm looks like. And so that's what I want to do today. And we're actually going to create and implement the bubble sort algorithm. Now, if you do not know what the bubble sort algorithm is, is it's a very naive implementation of a sorting algorithm. It's very slow and it's not something that you would ever use in a production environment. However, it it is a great tool for understanding how algorithms work and how to do things such as array manipulation and a number of other very important tasks. So it's great for computer scientists, just I would never suggest using it in the wild. I have given you quite a bit of less code than usual. Uh, in fact, all I've done is given you a test, but the test pretty much describes what we're looking to do. We're looking to add the bubble sort algorithm to the array class, and then we ensure that it properly sorts the array. And the way we're testing it is I have an array of integers here, and the expectation is if I call the bubble sort algorithm on the array, then it should equal the same set of values in the same order as if I just called the regular Ruby sort method on it. Now, if you've never done this kind of thing where you've added a method to a pre-existing class, then I think you're in for a treat. And before we actually get into how to do this with arrays, let me walk through the concept of monkey patching. So monkey patching is the ability to add or edit or methods inside of pre-existing classes. And so let's not do the array first. Let's give a, more of a base case example. So with the string class, you may know that the string class has the reverse method on it. So the reverse method, if I do something like my string and then call reverse on it, this actually will reverse all of the characters in my string. So like you can see right here, it's reversed each one of those characters. Now what you can do with monkey patching is you can actually change the way that this functions. So say instead of having it reversed, you could technically just have it output a bunch of gibberish. And now if I run this, you can see that instead of it doing its default process, it is actually just outputting what I put inside the method. This is one to give you a little idea that this is something that can be very dangerous and monkey patching is something you have to be very careful with because you could have some unknown consequences. Per, imagine that you did this in the application and another developer tried to call rever the reverse method later on, they would end up with some very different behavior. And that's just a very easy example. Usually this, uh, this ends up creating some bugs. So I don't, I'm not recommending that you do this on a regular basis. It's more just to show that it's possible. Now, in addition to editing methods, you also can do things like add new methods. So I could create a method here called my cool method. And inside of it, probably be helpful if I did something inside of it. Inside of, I'm just going to say, hey there. And then hit end. There you go. Okay, so now what I can do is, even though I have not done anything in terms of, you know, created a new class or done anything like that, because I opened up the string class right here, this new my cool method is actually available to it. So I can type in my cool method, and now if I run this code, you can see that this prints out, hey there. And the reason I wanted to kind of go through this exercise was to give you some kind of a base example of what we need to do with the array class. So notice how here I'm calling my cool method on the string directly, which means that I have successfully added this my cool method to the string class, at least for this file. And that's exactly what we need to do here. So whenever you want to have the ability to do something like this, where you can call a method on another class, then this is a great way of being able to update that. So I'm going to clear this off and also get rid of all of our example code here. And now let's talk about implementing bubble sort. So here, 
first thing we're going to want to do is implement the array class. So we're going to open up the array class and now inside of this we're going to create a new method. So this is going to be def and I want to make sure it has to be spelled exactly like that just like I have right here or else it'll throw an error in the test. And so now with this in place let's talk about what bubble sort needs to do. So the very first thing this is going to do, and I'm going to go with just pure programming, we're not going to use any built-in sorting mechanisms from Ruby, so this one's going to take a little bit longer to write out, but that's what some of you have been asking for, so I want to give that to you. So the very first thing that we're going to do with bubble sort is find the full length of the array. So the way that we can do that is I'm just going to set create a variable here called n and it's going to be equal to self dot length. Now self, whenever you open up a class like this, it's going to talk about the instance of that class. So in other words, right here, this array example here, this is an instance of the class. So when we're talking about when I call self, it is saying this value, this set of values right here. And if I had a different array with three values, then it would mean that array. Self always just references the instance that the method is being called on. So in this example, it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So n is going to equal seven right here. Now that we have that in place and the reason why we need to have that is we need a way of keeping track of how long the array is because bubble sort needs to know that so it knows how many times to iterate through. Now from there I'm going to create a loop. Now if you've never seen a loop created this way in Ruby it's uh, this is kind of one of the most basic kinds of loops. You probably are very used to loops such as each or even while. Loop is just a dead simple looping mechanism and something that is very important whenever you have a loop or when you create a loop exactly like this is with this you need to tell Ruby when the loop is done with. With each it makes it really nice and easy because each counts how many times that it's going to iterate and it doesn't you don't have to manually tell it when to stop it just stops whenever it's done iterating over the collection. With loop, if we didn't tell it when to stop, it could just go on forever and what that means in computer terms is that it would create an infinite loop and it would just crash the program. So that's something that you don't want to do. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create some type of value. It's called a sentinel value and that is a value that is going to tell the loop when to stop. I'm going to call it swapped. I'm going to start by setting it equal to false and then I'm at the very bottom of the algorithm I'm going to say break if not swapped. And so in other words uh, this is just a way of saying I want you to stop the loop when this is not swapped or when and this is another way of saying when it's not true. So what this is going to do is it's going to set swap to false in each loop and if that doesn't get changed to true then it's going to stop the loop. And if that's not the most clear don't worry I think it's going to help when we actually go through the example of seeing what these values do. Next thing we're going to do is I'm going to create another loop inside of this. So this is going to be a nested loop. So we're going to keep on going until this loop is finished essentially. And I'm going to say n minus 1 and the reason for this is because what length brings us back here is going to be in our test case it's going to be 7 but if it was an array of a thousand items it'd be a thousand items. But remember that arrays have a zero index which means that if we have an array like this it actually is zero. This starts if you count the index this is zero this is one, this is two, and if you add more, it'd keep on going just like that. So uh, we have to do n minus one in order to get the accurate number of times that we actually want to loop over. 
So I'm going to say n minus 1 times. And so this is going to count off to the sixth index for this, uh, for the, our test case. And then I'm going to say do and give a block variable of i. I'm also going to give us some space just so this makes a little bit more sense. And now inside of this, let's create our actual algorithm. So this is where we're, all the magic happens and we're gonna check and swap values and do all that kind of thing. So I'm gonna say if self i, and what this is looking at right here is self, as we've talked about, is the bubble sort call on the array. So it's if this instance right here of i, and if your array knowledge is still a little bit shaky, then you can look at something like this. And actually, let me sw swap over into this side and open up an IRB terminal. So right here, let's say that I have just a basic array here, and I want to, I'll just call this array. So now I have this array. If I want to select the first item in this array, then I would do array brackets zero, and that will grab me the first one. If I want to get the last one there, I can do two, that will get me the last one. So all that I'm doing right here is I am saying that if self i, and don't let the kind of the i terminology confuse you, that's exactly like what I am doing right here. All it's doing is it's grabbing the array and then it's passing in whatever that value is. Obviously we can't hard code it with numbers, instead what we're doing is we're hard coding the value here, So, or we're bringing in the value dynamically. So we're saying, okay, if that current value of i is greater than self of i plus 1. And so what this means is, remember how I just talked about how the process works, where this is grabbing the current value, and then plus 1 means we're looking one step ahead. So the way bubble sort works, and this is why it's so slow, is because we're going to iterate through the system, we're going to look at 4, and we're going to look at 1. And we're going to say, okay, is 4 greater than 1? It is, okay, we need to swap these values. So it, the in this first time, when it iterates through the first time, it is going to swap the values because the self i is greater than self i plus 1. So all self i plus 1 is doing is it's looking at the next value in the array. So here, the way that we swap this is I'm going to say self i and then self i plus 1 equals self i plus 1 self i. Now if you have never done an array swap before, this may look like the weirdest thing ever. And I think this is actually worthy of jumping over into IRB again. Because if this is new to you, then this may seem really weird. But that's why I want to help fix. So let's go create our array again right here. And let's create some other variables. So let's say that we want to create one variable called x, and we're going to set x equal to the first element in the array. So we're going to say r0. So now x is equal to 1. And then we're going to create another variable called y, and we'll set this equal to the next item in the array which is going to be 1. Okay, so now that we have those, we actually have the ability to swap these values. And the way you can do it is exactly the same syntax that I did over here, but I know that having all of these selfs in a line and these plus ones and everything like that is kind of confusing. But all we're really doing is we're just swapping the value. So right here I can say, y 
comma x. So notice how I've swapped the value. X was the first element, y was the next element. So I'm going to say y plus x and then equal array 0 and then array 1. And now if I do that, and you can see that I've actually swapped the value. So even though I grabbed these ones, then I've, uh, I've now successfully swapped the value. Uh, I didn't change the array because that didn't get swapped out. But this is a way where you can, it's just kind of a shortcut way of being able to swap the values that those are in. This is pretty much the same as me saying, something like uh, y and set this equal to uh, array 0 and then y or x to array 1 and now you can see that y is equal to 1 even though up here x was equal to 1 and now x is equal to 2. So all we're doing here is the same thing. We're just saying that these values on the left hand side here have now been swapped and so we have the order switched. I'm sorry if that took a little while to explain. I just know that that can be a point of confusion if you've never swapped array values before. And I recommend just going through yourself, uh, if that still is a little fuzzy, on some examples like this and see how you can swap these values. Remember, the right-hand side is the value. The left-hand side is what it's getting assigned to. So in this case, we're swapping it. So y would be equal to the first element, x to the, to the second, which is the reverse order that we had before. Okay, so now that we have that in place, all we're saying is we're looking at 4 in this example and 1. And since those are, since this is true where the first one, 4, is greater than 1, then swap the value. So the next value, or the next time around, the array is going to be 1 and 4. And that's pretty much the way bubble sort works all the way around. And then from that point, we're going to set swapped equal to true and then hit end and then this is just going to keep on going 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 and then eventually it's going to hit a spot where the loop does not uh, where the loop swap value is false and when that is the case then it is going to come here and it's going to break out the last thing that we do have to do is we have to return self and what that means is that at the very end of this array when it's completely done working then it's going to return the finished value it's going to return the new value of the array so let's see if this works well uh, I'm just going to grab this value right here and now let's call bubble sort on it so I'm going to say R bubble sort and let's run this and let's see if it works okay let's see yes this works so as you can see right here we had an array that started 4 1 6 10 and now we have an array that is 1 2 3 4 6 10 and 44 so that's all working now another thing that I think is very helpful right here is look at this line of code and this is one of the reasons why I love having my code rendering right in the pane because I can see exactly how it's working so right here the first time around we have an array of 1 and 4 and it's doing that comparison then it's 2 and 44 then 3 and 44 and see how it's breaking it down and each one of these steps is how it is processing each one of these items and how it's comparing it and then eventually how it's swapping it and I know it's not the most clear but that also gives you a little bit idea of what it's doing on this swap process now also take a look right here where you see all of these true false true false and all of these well look and you this can help you kind of analyze what bubble sorts doing one it tells you how many comparisons that it runs so even though you may think that you know this is just seven values look at how many times that this loop ran and it's because it needed to keep looping and performing these comparisons like we guessed the very first time that it iterates it looks at self 
and 4 is greater than 1, so that's true. The next time it looked at the next item in the list, 1 and 6, which, or, or 4 and 6, and that one was false, and it just keeps on going the, down the line. And that's the reason why bubble sort is so slow, because if it had to perform this many comparisons for seven items, imagine how many you'd have to do for a million items. It'd be astronomical. So uh, bubble sort is very good for learning how to do all kinds of tasks. And if you followed along, great job. This was not an easy exercise to do, but you learned a lot. One, you learned about monkey patching on how we could add a method to a pre-existing class in Ruby. Then you learned about how to implement a full sorting algorithm called bubble sort. And then you learned about two different types of loops, just a regular bland loop and then also a times loop. Then you learned more about comparisons and then how to swap array values like we did right here and then how to break out of the loop and how to return a value. So I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that all of this is working, but we still do need to run our tests. So I'm going to get out of our IB, IRB and let's run our spec December 29th. And you can see we have one example, zero failure. So great job if you went through that. That was quite a bit of code writing, but uh, it sounded like a lot of people were asking for some manual implementations of algorithms. So I hope you enjoyed it.